So welcome to today's VOD uh, TV conversation with Asfi uh, Shaheen. And we will bring his image up in a second, but we're going to talk about the roughly 27% of the population in the U.S. that lives in homeowners and condo associations. Well, we're not going to really talk about them, but we're going to talk about the concept of some of the things that apply to them being in a condo association, bringing that to the fiber side of the business, bringing fiber out further and bringing it to the home. And, and that's really Asfi Shaheen's concept. And it's something that uh, I, I had similar ideas uh, many years ago. And thanks to the internet, he, we discovered each other. Really, he discovered me. And I really appreciate that because he's uh, he brings a lot of credibility to this. He had a, a tower share network for a wireless tower that he sold and, uh, and came to the United States a couple of years ago. And this is something that has been a, a burning desire. So... We'll talk a little bit about what motivated you, but first let's talk about the concept of a fiber condo association, if you will. Sure. Look, uh, I mean, you can call it a fiber cooperative, you can call it a fiber condominium, but you know, ultimately the idea is you have users owning fiber networks and it's not, uh, I just want to be clear with assigning credit, it's not my idea. I read this beautiful paper by uh, Tim Wu and Derek Slater. They wrote a paper in 2008 called Homes right. with Sales. What if you could own your internet connection? So, I mean, that paper describes in painful detail uh, how this concept would work. And they basically conclude by saying, well, we don't really see any technical reason why it can't work. So I've basically just taken that paper and I've explored, I've been exploring what are ways to finance this and what would the total cost of ownership look like? What would the monthly spend look like? And, you know, for me, what was also interesting was, um, so I used to be an investment banker in a past life. I, I come from the financial services world. And, you know, ever since the financial crisis, this home equity line of credit product, it's really declined a lot um, in terms of total lending volume. And, and home equity line of credit is an interesting product because it remains interest only for 10 years. And then you have 20 years to pay it back. So I started playing with this idea that, you know, what if, what would the monthly cost look like at like uh, uh, when you, if you used a home equity line of credit to pay for a fiber connection that let's say cost five thousand dollars? Now it's important for you to know like you know why is five thousand dollars kind of a big deal? You see like when you go beyond three thousand dollars per household connected, the payback period extends to ten plus years, and internet companies don't have access to money that can pay for. I mean they can't access twenty year money, they can't access thirty year money. They're not in a regulated business. And so because of that, you know, it's very difficult for private internet companies to pay for uh, expensive infrastructure like fiber. So I've, I've been thinking, you know, what are, what, are, what are ways to get 30 year money to the table, 20, 30 year money to the table. And I mean, one is of course, like, you know, uh, you, you can work with your city government, they can issue a municipal bond. We see a lot of these happening. One is, you know, this home equity line of credit or a home equity loan. And I really love the concept that you would written about, which is, uh, you know, you do a property assessment. But the thing to remember is that they're all doing the same thing. They're all in some, they're all getting the homeowner to pay for the fiber and treat it as a long term investment. And the magic of that idea is that, you know, if you can make this whole scheme work, um, many, many places that are considered unfeasible by private ISPs will now start becoming feasible and we'll start getting more fiber out there, which is great for connectivity. So that's kind of it. You know, I mean, like my, my, my concept is literally just like, okay, there's this, there's this lovely idea people have talked about. How do I finance it? And so I only think about the financing equation and then also think about the kind of people I've dealt with in a past life and what kind of questions will they ask and how do I get them comfortable enough to sign legal agreements that will actually get money to the table. Yeah, and I, when I wrote my article several years ago, um, I, I'd, I'd forgotten it actually. I'd read the Derek Wu uh, or the, uh, yeah, the paper Tim. that you, yeah, Tim Wu, I'm sorry, the paper that you'd referenced. Uh, yeah. I'd forgotten about that, but I'd had this epiphany because uh, in California, they have a similar program where you can use your home equity to finance solar and yeah. just the two things. Well, why not do this for broadband? I had it same exact same thinking. And, and in fact, like, I mean, even for me, like, you know, the idea came independent. I mean, I, 
my th- my idea came independently and then but like i've kind of always had this belief and that's why i love the internet so much that no matter what your idea is somebody else is thinking about it and that's why i'm like a huge fan of the internet right like uh, and i've had that always happen to me like no matter what i'm thinking somebody else is thinking of it and there's a good chance you can learn something from them I kind of signed on to this mission to make internet for all happen um for for four and a half five years ago four and a half years ago and so you know um the the kind of the conclusion of that mission or the application of that mission was that deploy a ton of fiber and and, and make sure that it is treated like a that it, that it delivers cost based pricing so you know it was always on my mind that i want to deploy a ton of fiber and find ways to finance fiber and so everything else is kind of you know just like a further application of it of course you know along the way like looking at past efforts it's it's uh, it's helpful to then see you know okay what are the pros and cons because i mean i'm not attached to like any one model like i don't view this as that you know okay this is net equities model and so therefore i've got some religious attachment to it it's like i mean there are like there are pros and cons to all these approaches and maybe all of them will not work everywhere but you know the commitment i've kind of signed up for is saying just kind of keep chipping away and you know as you kind of keep talking to more people you know more ideas will emerge i mean ideas that are and like i would say better applications will emerge it becomes kind of a tool in a toolbox in a in a sense right where you've, you've added a new tool absolutely i mean my um, initially my initial application just so you know had nothing to do with home equity loans like when i first thought about this idea i was actually playing with this idea of fractional ownership i i saw this um research um that fiber optic association are dancing you know fiberizing a home makes it more valuable and you know it, it's debatable how much valuable this and that and you know if you're like a total academic you'll kind of uh, poke some holes into some of their analysis which some of my academic friends did but leaving that aside intuitively it does make sense that homes with fiber are more desirable to live in to rent to sell and buy so i started thinking that okay if this latent home value if there there is latent home value can that be harnessed somehow like can we have a situation where you do this deal where you say i'm going to deploy fiber uh private capital will pay for fiber and then instantly you know i'll sell like 5% of my home and like you know i'll kind of be made whole because i would have actually you know um, it's like adding a new restroom or something or improving exactly, your restroom right? Right? it's like adding a new restroom so i started playing around a lot with this concept initially that you know can we create these fiber backed securities through fractional ownership and there are a number of fractional ownership companies that are popping up now like there's noa there's the home tap there's oh, okay. unison and so i uh, but then as i spoke to these companies i realized they said look we are only doing the urban market i mean you want to do rural we can't do fractional ownership we we don't have we are not comfortable selling a fractional ownership product to a rural home and also on the other end i mean rural home owners i spoke to were like that sounds really weird that i would sell 5% of my home to some equity investor i don't know if i want to do that so i kind of then moved on from that saying okay crap this is not working so you know what could work and so that's when i kind of stumbled upon this home equity thing um but you know i mean that is an improvement but that also has some issues um and then you know similarly and that's of course like you know along the same thinking uh, i came across uh, your article on property assessments so you know they're all kind of emerging from the same thought process which is hey how do we bring 30 year money uh to pay for fiber and how do we ensure that the owner has no incentive to um create artificial scarcity of bandwidth which is basically the hallmark of of telecoms right like they have to create artificial scarcity in order to earn a return again not their fault it's nothing to do this is not a te- i don't want to say like oh, telecoms are evil it's like this is just their incentive structure so um and what distinguishes this idea of bringing in you know the private money is that you're not compelling your neighbor to do this i mean clearly you need to have enough people saying yeah i want to do this to yep. justify bringing the fiber wherever it is but yep. you're not unlike a municipal bond or something where everyone has to pay that yep. you know or on the hook for it yeah uh, so once talk to that for a moment yeah look i mean and that's i think that's a pretty key part of this right because see this is where the hybrid models start becoming exciting right like you do a bit of fiber and a bit, a bit of fixed wireless I, i'll give you like let me like play you through an example right like like where i went to university right lancaster pennsylvania or any take any university town right 
you generally have professors who you know are i would say reasonably well off like you know they have their um tenure track they own their homes right these guys can easily pay 5 6 thousand even 10000 dollars to bring fiber connection to their home but a lot of times like their neighbors may not be able to right like but now if you had this user owned network and let's say you could bring fiber to one home and your neighbors couldn't your neighbors can still put up a three hundred dollar um, my a uh, uh, dish by Mimosa or by Ubiquity or by any of these basic players and basically start using your bandwidth, right? Like the big pipe that you're bringing into your home. I, ultimately, what's going on, right? Like you're buying a gigabit circuit from some middle mile provider, some Indatel like company. <laughs> this is where a fiber pop is. You bring all that bandwidth somewhere. And then, you know, you can think of this fiber as like also like a water sprinkler that can help out your neighbors, right? So um, I think that for me is quite powerful. Now, no ISP will allow you to just resell bandwidth, right? Any time an ISP, I mean, if you like ISPs will always have a problem with you reselling bandwidth for a variety of reasons, like some commercial, some legal. But, you know, if you design the system in this way where you're saying, OK, there will be some wealthy people that will be comfortable enough paying six, seven, eight thousand dollars to, you know, bring a fiber network to their home you recognize not everyone in their neighborhood will have that kind of spending power or that willingness you can have hybrid solutions emerging. Like, you know, I mean, if so long as this person with the fiber connection in their home is willing to share some bandwidth with a neighbor, I can now start, I can now start really like, you know, um, pushing out a better connectivity. I can find, you know, a better way to like uh, finance these fiber laterals, if you will, right? Like this is not an investment that, a middle mile provider would make this is not an investment an isp would make and uh yeah but like and again you know this also then brings some really cool elements of choice right like mm -hmm. um you know you're not kind of forced to sign up um so um the other thing i you know that makes this possible that 20 years ago it wouldn't have been and even probably back in the day when uh, tim Wu and derek wrote that paper yeah. is that now you're able to kind of decouple the infrastructure from the provision of service. So yeah. you can have this third party actually being the one providing the service for the quote unquote owners of the infrastructure, right? Man, I think this is, I mean, why I'm like so you know in love with like tech and following progress and why I moved to Silicon Valley. I mean, I, and I wouldn't say that like all the progress happens in Silicon Valley. In fact, like most of the connectivity innovations I've seen have not been in Silicon Valley. Right. Actually do, like, you know, like come, I mean, other places, right? But like- sure. I feel like staying in the conversation, you keep seeing a lot of new things, very cool things emerge, right? Like that makes more and more of these ideas possible. And so you're right. And they kind of build on each other, right? Like, I mean, you know, I mean, like, you know, you're talking about like, uh, you know, uh, progress that software defined networks have made that that makes it possible now to, you know, ha like do this separation of infrastructure from services. Um, and, and, you know, the the, the deployment in, in, in AM in Idaho is an interesting example mm -hmm. of that. Uh, but in, in a, on a completely different frontier, I mean, there's a company I've been interacting with, following and learning from, they're called Altia. They're, they found a way to, uh, you know, use cryptocurrency for people to pay each other for bandwidth so it's like literally your your payment is kind of coded in the back in the packet that you know you're helping your neighbor forward they call so it you can create a mesh network in that in their instance they right? have actually done that they have created a mesh network and they've they're creating an interesting incentive for people to put up infrastructure and get paid directly right now again these kind of efforts like yeah again you know all of these efforts are like happening uh, I would say separately, independently, to some extent, I would say they're still in infancy, but I mean, they're, they're gathering steam, right? Like, and like real deployments are happening. Users are sh signing up. And so that, I find all of that quite lovely to play with because, you know, it starts like, I can start seeing like a solution emerge uh uh that you know that that just starts making the whole financial equation work i mean that's that's the mindset i bring to this conversation right like how do you satisfy the money and the lawyers 
to write to sign documents and write checks right like and um i kind of you know flirt with technology uh to see you know if um like a solution can be configured and the and the problem set that i kind of commit to is saying you know will this make connectivity more affordable while satisfying the constraints both technical financial and legal that we've assigned uh to uh to this uh, to this problem well and it's interesting um and you've identified some of these but oftentimes the constraints really aren't um the technology uh or the business model per se but it's things like the regulatory and and things that um in, in some ways are well defined but you gave an example of in california a sequa study adding yeah i don't know how many thousands of dollars per home it is it was five thousand dollars, five thousand six hundred per home. I mean, there's a there's a guy. He... So so just to yeah. clarify that the study, the CEQA is the California Environmental Quality Act, and that is intended to make sure that we don't do projects that harm the environment. In this case, I believe it was a fiber deployment, yeah. and it added five thousand six hundred dollars per home yeah. just for the study. Is that yeah? What? Yeah. Well, I mean, like I mean, you know, but again, like to be fair, I mean, I got more feedback on that tweet. Like uh, one of the guys, uh, I think. Um, from New York City, Mesh, he mentioned that it's because these homes are located next to like a like a forest or a or a or like a park, uh, like a national park. So that's why it's costing so much more. So I mean that that kind of made well, sense. Yeah, it does. But I just speaking from personal experience, when I looked at doing yeah. this in Silicon Valley, I, yeah. I believe, and I can't remember the study the the numbers, but I believe at some point Google had said they'd spent two or three hundred dollars on their CEQA study for San Jose. Now, with that said, you know, if you have a 200,000 homes of San Jose, it's a dollar, you know, buck 50 or whatever per home. But yeah. I, I can't I, I imagine that the, the fixed cost for a study, regardless of the size of the community, might not be that much different. Maybe it's a little bit cheaper, but, you know, and it, there's up on a cost per yeah. home. So, see, of course, connectivity is into a great extent, a political will game. Right. Like, I mean, people have to recognize that, OK, like. You know, first they have to believe that they, you know that, that certain regulation is a problem. Then they need to like do something about it. The fun thing I find about America as a country, as a market, is that there are like fifty countries to choose from. Mm. Right? Like, I mean, I, I, I view this as fifty countries, right? Like, they're kind of that's a, that's a good point. That, and that's you have such different laws. I mean, people are like, yeah. you know, America is one big market. America is not one big market. I mean, the, the the laws of setting up a cooperative in Kentucky are totally different from doing it in Oregon. And like, you know, the like, I mean, laws on everything, right? Like on how much interest rate you can charge or like, you know, uh, what kind of studies you need to get started or like, you know, do you what kind of licensing do you need to do a poll attachment agreement? They like vary a lot. So, I mean, there are like 50 countries, right? But like 50 large countries. And um, I think like, um, I mean, I find like personally, I haven't like felt limited. I, I mean, yeah, like, yeah, like, I mean, yes, I think, you know, it, what, what I've heard from many folks is that this sequa is a bit of a unique thing to California. Uh, yeah, it is. Yeah. You know, so, um, so yeah, I think like, I mean, and you know, it, it, it again also comes down to, right. Like how closely are your lawmakers personally impacted as well? Right. Like, I mean, like we've seen a lot of movement in the last one year on legislation by state level lawmakers uh, that have really grown to recognize that okay connectivity is a serious problem we've got a serious problem and i feel like right now i mean where i feel like america is right now i mean there is a genuine realization that okay broadband's a problem and i feel like the conversations now about okay how do we fix it and, I, and you know where i would like to you know offer my two cents is saying look you know, when you're thinking about a broadband bill, don't just think about, you know, um, raising federal taxes and giving money to, I would say, ISPs or even city governments. Think about giving tax credits directly to homeowners that can, you know, pay for infrastructure and, you know, they can potentially, uh, you know, do a better job holding service providers accountable. They can probably I'd like to think they can do a better job, uh, you know, um, I mean, building networks cheaper, right? Like, uh, uh, but again, for all of that to happen, you have to remove the, I would say the mystery and the, the perceived difficulty in building, operating, managing these networks.
and uh, yeah and there i feel like i see a lot of companies making some really cool progress so yeah and you know to your point i, I shouldn't have been so california specific because there's clearly and i've dealt with a lot of these folks up in the upper midwest you get to the dakotas uh, yeah. north dakota south dakota the Min uh, minnesota wisconsin yeah. iowa they have really um figured out they've cracked the nut it seems in terms of you know uh, making an environment that allows for creativity in terms of you know cooperatives and getting right. fiber in the ground that makes sense right like i mean i like i mean even with like other things right like like cryptocurrency i mean there are some states that are like you know a lot more friendlier than others right like uh, and you know i think i think in i mean that's also i think another really cool feature about america right like do states do get to compete with one another and there is states battle it out for talent mm -hmm. and i think right now there's a very interesting battle for talent going on and i feel like i mean i lately seeing you know both uh, texas and florida and colorado becoming contenders and basically challenging california for talent being like okay i mean you know well here's the deal that you get over here and here's the deal that you get over here and and that's really cool i think i feel like for an entrepreneur for an immigrant you know like knowing that you know i could like literally like i mean i choose to currently be in california i think like despite the uh, you know the taxes and the legislation the limitation i feel like it's such a fertile ground of because so much amazing talent over here but i mean you know it, it, it has happened in the past where um you know, locations tend to get complacent and they just basically start taking talent for granted. And then, you know, in like, particularly uh, the period we're in, I mean, moving is very straightforward. It, it's not, it doesn't take much to move. No, right? especially if, if, if you have the broadband, you can be anywhere, right? You can basically be anywhere. And the other area that uh, you touched upon in your website and in your uh, writings and so forth is the use of the electrical grid as a mechanism for low cost fiber. And you've done some work with some yeah. larger entities on that. Do you want to talk to that for a moment? Yeah, 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 of course. Look, I mean, so I think, I mean, you know, I think broadly, like I think about fiber as a construction and financing problem, right? Like, and the key, as you know, the you, you, most of your listeners would know that the cable doesn't cost any the cost is not in the materials it's in the labor and uh, so when i actually came to america um i had this one i was very fortunate that you know i uh, that i was able to work out this um uh, consulting arrangement with facebook that let me speak to a number of their engineers and one of their engineers um a guy named karthik who who i work very closely with he had this idea this beautiful idea that you know we could what if we could create a machine that just wrapped fiber on overhead electrical power lines and that if this could be done rapidly at a very low cost at a very fast pace it could like really you know create a big dent in the overall fiberization equation and i um but you know the kind of uh design challenge he gave to me was he said like but we've got to make sure that, you know, we don't turn this network into a rent seeker. And we've got to make sure that, you know, we treat this as an open access network that delivers cost-based pricing. So how do we do that? And so in thinking about that, I, will, I started thinking about the electric utility as an anchor tenant and thinking about the electric, what kind of benefits would an electric utility get if they got fiber along their grid? And it um, turns out there are a number of benefits. There are a number of monitoring benefits that an electric sure. utility can realize uh, in terms of both in terms of, you know, cost reductions for electrical line losses and even um, capex reductions in terms of reducing their spend on cop uh, copper cables. Uh, you know, when you kind of go, when a, when a substation moves from copper cabling to fiber, its footprint declines by 60, 70 percent. That's a substantial capex and opex decrease so i mean the, the case for those words was very strong and you know electric utilities have also kind of followed the population and so the thinking was okay i mean you don't really need to reinvent the the mapping exercise basically just follow the substations and you know retrofit fiber on electrical power lines so that is very much um uh, an effort i am still involved with i mean it's i think it's worth kind of acknowledging this is a very this is a hard problem sure that, Arthik and his team are trying to solve, right? Like getting, you know, making the tech work, getting the utilities comfortable. I have like tons of confidence and faith in Karthik. He's just a very, very talented, extremely 
brilliant guy um and you know but where the the solution's not ready yet and i can't really talk about timelines but i'm optimistic that it will be soon so once that's ready uh, i do plan to uh, you know use that technology and create public private partnerships in certain countries uh, by and and what that and just to get a bit more specific about what i mean by a public private partnership um i love um, so highways are the most highest capex per meter item in the in the, out of all infrastructure and um one technique that has been used quite a bit to finance highways is this technique called an availability payment scheme this is a pretty cool technique because what you what a government is doing is they're saying the private capital should put up the capital to build and create and operate the infrastructure the government says i'm just going to assume demand risk i am telling you mm. that i know demand is here only if there is a demand shortfall will i give you money so interesting the government basically says so long as your pipe is on i will give you money but the government takes a bet saying there's so much demand that we'll never really have to pay right and so this kind of a network uh, has been built in indonesia with this kind of a scheme so this uh, is a, hi a highway though in the, in this case it's, it's not a highway it's a, it's a oh, fiber okay. project as in like okay. uh, in the closest example of what i'm describing the palapa ring in indonesia is a submarine fiber optic ring running go doing making a big giant circle around the islands of indonesia and uh, it is under an availability payment scheme now availability payment schemes in fiber networks come in a lot of shapes and forms right like how the risk reward is shared it varies now in america the the only fiber optic network under an ap scheme is this network called kentucky wired that network mm -hmm. unfortunately ran into a lot of i would say um it it became a political and and pr disaster for a right. lot of reasons, right um and you know which which i can't really get into which it's not even yeah, worth that's a topic of a whole another talk but, yeah but the, but the idea is great right the idea of a statewide middle mile network that is under cost based pricing and and treated like a public utility that's a great idea um you know and of course like you know how you implement it like there are like you know 20 variations that come in but that for me is um you know one thing that i continue to work on and um you know it's very much part of the longer push um another way just the last thing to say about this idea so um we had another observation that's really worth sharing we there are like 5 million cell towers in the world and um you know many many more of them are connected to the electrical grid versus fiber it varies from country to country but like you know in a country like mine pakistan like currently fiberization of towers is 15 maybe 20% but 93% of all cell towers are connected to the electrical grid so the thinking is okay if you're following the electrical grid to deploy fiber you will instantly fiberize all these cell towers and that will create a lot more capacity in uh, the telecom network and that is important for emerging markets because um, a lot of people only use mobile to access sure. internet if you can give them a fatter pipe you know you can dramatically improve the connectivity experience so that's kind of the the one element and i mean the common thread between this business miss middle mile utility work and even the homeowner work is get fiber out there um but make sure it's under cost based pricing now whether you do a public private partnership or whether you do user owned fiber at the core what you're doing is you're removing demand risk from the equation you see utilities are able to get long term financing because someone someone removes demand risk from the equation this someone can either be a government body or it can be the user himself or herself right you have to find a way to remove demand risk to finance fiber networks at scale in rural areas that's a view that i'm pretty clear on so and that's the kind of thinking that i continue to i mean mull over yeah and that's uh, an important point about the fiber and that's a, a great way to to put it but the other part about the fiber itself um the endpoints are going to change and there's going to be some churn in that and that'll be kind of a, a short term expense in one sense but that fiber is a 30 or 40 year investment um yeah right yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's like building a house. But that that's the thing, right? Like it's like I mean it is a very long-term asset 
you know no no one's a, no one has a problem with the asset value the, the the lifetime value of a fiber network people just have a problem that you know you can't get reliable contracted cash flows like even a company right. like zeo you know giant wholesale fiber network their contract length is 5 years right and so you know why can't an entity like zeo enter into 30 year contracts well i mean this is a long story where it has to do with how telecoms are just set up but, right but you've but you've you've kind of tackled that by having the owner own the fiber right, right? i mean yeah as in i mean of course and then tackled in the sense like and theoretically tackled by the time right. we i mean you know like actually go down to applying it making it work i mean you know like yeah it's will 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 figure it out right yeah. like i mean i think i, I mean i'm um, yeah i think i mean for me you know the ideal end state would be that i mean yeah i think like the more i think the more simpler we can make it for like private capital to just invest in a couple of miles of fiber and like have a very clean way of earning a return on that i feel like uh you know this uh, uh this problem i mean there that 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 you know will continue to like uh uh to solve this problem. Well, and it's an important time to have this conversation because in Washington there's been uh, you know there's clearly recognition that you want to get rid of the um accessibility issue and there's really it seems like there's two issues there's the accessibility and the affordability. Yeah. And in one sense those are kind of two challenges but on the accessibility focusing on that for a second. Yeah. Um it, it seems like what you provide is this ability to extend subsidies or get more out of them so maybe there's no subsidy needed or maybe a little less than would be needed if it's a really rural area yeah totally look I, every time i look at like fiber maps even if i look at endotel's fiber map right or like i mean if there was some way to get all the middle mile fiber maps of america i don't have them but i'm pretty sure that we'll find that everyone's living within a mile of those networks everyone you know so we're like talking that's that's the challenge that we're trying to solve right like and but the, the challenge where things become tough right you've got 20000 incorporated places in america 10000 16000 of these incorporated places have less than 10000 people 10000 people means like 3 to 5000 homes 3 to 5000 homes isn't an attractive market for an isp to enter it's also not a very attractive market for a local isp to say i'll serve you know 3 to 5000 homes i mean it's it or because sometimes the the knowledge isn't there and sometimes you know the willingness isn't there and so on and so forth how do you kind of solve the challenge for these 16000 incorporated places well i mean you kind of chop up the problem right like okay financing and construction the problem okay like i mean okay this is one way to solve the financing problem uh but then you also have to figure out like how do you maintain and operate this thing there are there are both problems i feel like uh they need to be tackled in parallel that's that's exactly what we're doing we're trying to like extend this network you know not just extend it make sure that the extended network is very open that it is that you know you can do kind neighborly things for your neighbors by saying okay i mean you know i've paid for all this infrastructure i'm happy to share some of it with you we've got these very simple radios that can let you do that right or even other acts of kindness being like hey i'm bringing this whole thing here i i mean i know i can afford it i know you can't necessarily afford it but like you know i'm happy to like pay uh you know the connection cost for you share the running costs with me like these are the kind of things i feel like can happen at a local level that you know um i would say like you know you struggle to do these things at a centralized level right mm -hmm. uh, and the other thing is you know if you try to do like a 100 home project right that you're talking <laughs> half a million dollar project half a million dollar fiber construction job so long as you've got your permits in place right you're talking 8 to 10 weeks to complete a half a million dollar construction job uh you know and this is again coming from like actual quotes right that you're getting that i'm getting from like fiber construction companies you try to do like a 50 million dollar project like well it's going to take that much longer right because you know you can't go faster so you know that's the other thing right trying to make these projects more bite sized someone listening and would be like well i mean that's never really going to work because you know you can't just build uh, in one area of the town but not in the other area well the answer to that is well okay like start at the homes that are most adjacent to an existing middle mile network 
So I mean, if you've got middle mile running like this, and you've got a bunch of homes here, if you just make a little ring right. like this, well, I mean, yeah, that can totally. I mean, there are no, there's no like, um, there's. I mean, that's you've been pretty efficient, right? right? of households per mile that you've actually managed to serve by deploying fiber. If you think about how the internet grew and it was built, right, it was like very modular, right? Like people were kind of building their own little networks and they kind of plugged in, right? Telecom is different. Telecom has always liked to have a nice vertically integrated plan, right? Like where you do like, you know, one country, one network. That has some scale limitations, especially if you are doing it uh, as in a competitive market um so you know uh, this approach is hopefully going to you know create like a viable third option well and and the biggest challenge i see it's especially you know going to your like 100 home condo association mm -hmm. type thing if if they're if they don't have a kind of an organizational basis to kind of bring those people together in the first place it's getting started right is the challenge it seems like there's lots of opportunities for companies to help them. I mean, there's probably a thousand cooperatives and yeah. uh, independent uh, WISPs and so forth that that are out there. And it seems like they could help as far as providing service and maybe even helping with you know organizing construction. But how do you get started? What do you think? I think I, I think you start by first having conversations, right? Like I think for me, I mean, I think I mean I'm very open. Like my view is like. I mean, if you think of a WISP entrepreneur, right, like that who is just knows how to construct, build and manage a network, this person can either take money from an investor and then satisfy equity and debt requirements or basically have the users own the network and say, I'm going to earn a fixed fee. One way or another, this person is going it's to kind of like that. a condo manager, right? They don't right. own the condos, but they it manage. Might be more cost effective for people, some of these guys to become condo managers, right? Yeah. Especially if they can do construction effectively. So I think my my I mean where I'm at is like it's just about like getting the word out there. Like I mean talking to finding more allies, right? You know, I mean, I'm like exploring like very different types of allies. Like last week, I made a presentation at my university about this concept. And I'm finding universities are a very interesting anchor to start this concept because, you know, professors have been living in a particular area for a while. You know, there is a close association. You know, you can form a cooperative uh, with existing professors. Professors tend to mm -hmm. own their homes. You know, And so there is like something over there. Right. Similarly, I had another call with um, uh, this. Um, I'm forgetting their name, but it's an agricultural body that oversees farming cooperatives in Kentucky. Um, I don't want to mess up their name, but um, that's okay. But they, I mean, you know, because they're familiar with farming cooperatives, the two people on the call, they instantly got it and they said, look, we're busy for the next couple of months, but would love for our members to speak to you because mm -hmm. we have not thought about it like this, but we would love to, you know. So I feel like that's interesting. I mean, there's a third one is, um, you know, I... Um, um i've got these uh, uh guys i know at entry point networks they're the ones who built that uh, network uh, network in Ammon, idaho they were um they and me and them we collectively uh spoke to city of placerville and said like you know maybe uh, try out both options right like i mean talk to your constituents about a private condo and a municipal network right like maybe like you know and that that's like another because for me i mean i don't feel um, you know, uh, defensive about uh, about any other effort that is not making this choice because I say like ultimately I'm mission aligned. I want to get fiber out there, and I'll find a way on how to join that conversation. I'm not too worried about what will Net Equity's business model be. So you know, maybe have both conversations. So you know, like you can see now, like there are like different types of conversations, right? You're talking to city governments <laughs> about both options: municipal broadband and uh, fiber co-ops. You're talking to universities about creating fiber co-ops, getting the student body involved because the university has a convening power. You're talking to um, uh, uh, existing cooperative associations that understand this, uh, this element, this idea of how cooperatives work. Now, which one will be an early adopter? It's too soon to tell. I don't know. Uh, will One thing I know, getting independent homeowners, getting 40 independent homeowners to just come together and create a co-op, I don't think they will be the early adopters. I think that would be very difficult. I think that I think that a more of a 
I think I will need like because I mean this whole effort can't work if you don't have community champions, if you don't have right. something that gives you convening power, right? And also, I mean, it's an infrastructure project. A lot can go wrong, right? right? So it'll be it'll be important to like parallel track efforts and keep an open mind, and then you know see what happens. So that's kind of my commitment for 2021 to say that you know push this agenda of user owned fiber networks talk to different constituents see where you're likely to find you know the most the the strongest response from the other end because i my biggest asset is my time right like i'm also kind of i'm constantly looking for opportunities where i can commit my time to um, I mean, I um, ran into an interesting situation uh, last month. I was talking to these 36 homeowners in LaGrange, Kentucky to build a network like this. But then the city, their city, their county, Oldham County contacted them to say, hey, we're going to build a network. So you guys should stop. And and that's totally fine. Right. Like, I mean, I wouldn't want them to like replicate something right. that's going on. So, you know, there's I find like there's a lot of like learning that's going to come. Uh, along the way as you know I kind of keep sort of fishing out this idea I feel like there are like more threads that haven't been explored yet particularly threads with construction companies I think I think I mean I'm very excited about the prospect of partnering better with construction companies and particularly fiber contractors to say hey you should also become part of this cash flow that you know I mean at a very macro level can there's homes in america are paying what 60 to 100 dollars per month for their internet where is it going okay it's going you know partially it's going to stockholder returns management salaries some infrastructure like okay for the same kind of price you can own fiber and redirect that spend and how are you redirecting it some is going into your home some is going into you know your community or like other people who are like helping you build manage and operate this network can that is there an opportunity to redistribute that cash flow absolutely there is but it requires conversation it requires you know um it requires constantly engaging and frankly it also requires like not getting discouraged not dying out because i mean as you would know you know being a fellow innovator once you try something new i mean the expert starts throwing stones at you instantly they're like no this is never going to work you're this is just nonsense and like you know you're just misleading people and you're doing this and you're doing that and like i mean you know so that's kind for me you know that's kind of it right i'm like okay this is like the right problem to solve i mean you know getting a lot of fiber out there is the right thing to work on just you know stay persistent keep at it and you know um be like water as bruce lee says right like <laughs> a lot of uh, challenges that will keep coming in like you know just keep pushing ahead and we'll kind of see where we land up um in a in a in about a year or so well it makes sense i mean and i think to the naysayers it's it's about tools in the toolbox and applying the right tool to the right situation right so it may not work for this but it might work for something else Absolutely. I value those naysayers who like, you know, I, I mean, for me, like people who've like built networks, people who've tried something, people who like really like struck their neck out there. Like, you know, for the irony, of course, is they never criticize. Right. Like I've seen like people who have really kind of stuck their neck out there to try to like build infrastructure. They are like, you know, the most empathetic and curious <laughs> the ones who are throwing rocks are usually like, you know, analysts who've like you know never really risked personal capital or built a network and i mean they're you know so you know and i mean so and so the, the challenge with that criticism is like not a lot of it is valid right? right so you have to also just kind of see okay i mean is this person credible or is this person basically a keyboard warrior who's basically never built infrastructure right like yeah it's, it's, it's easy to be in the stands looking into the arena but it's tough to be in the arena